for today for this Palm and Passion Sunday morning service is the edge of eternity. Love's victory. As we prepare to turn to God's word, I want to invite you to think about eternity. We live, actually all of us, at the edge of eternity. We've celebrated over the last few weeks a number of services, saying goodbye and giving thanks for members of this church family who've gone on uh, to their homecoming with the Lord. Each of us, though, lives at that mark, just slightly between life and death. We will all pass the threshold sooner or later. Indeed, the good news is that God's eternity reaches out to us in this temporal life and invites us to know that the kingdom has come in Jesus. Jesus, living here as one of us in this mortal and fallen existence in which we share, saw eternity and saw the big story at the edge of eternity. And indeed, he is the edge of eternity. He is the way through which we will be saved if we would call on his name and truly give ourselves to him. That's the gospel message. That's the invitation, not only on Palm and Passion Sunday as we look ahead to his cross, but also Easter and the resurrection to come. And so I invite you to be reflecting on that, not only as we hear God's word, but throughout this week, that you might know Jesus and find your life at the edge of eternity through him, understanding what he has done to save you and to redeem all creation. So let's pray. Lord, open our hearts to the bigger story of who you are, what your cross meant, what your coming to Jerusalem meant, what your resurrection meant, and most definitely what your ascension meant and means as the kingdom plan of unfolds, which you see at the edge of eternity. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen. So our central passage for today, the first couple of verses in the middle of Luke chapter 10, we'll be returning to Luke chapter 10 next Sunday for Easter at this middle section, and we'll continue reading the verses that follow, the ones we're going to start with today. Uh, But today, verses 17 and 18 of Luke chapter 10, then we'll read some related passages from the Bible, from Luke 11, verse 17 through 23, and then from the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ to John, chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Hear now God's word. The 72 returned with joy. Remember, they've been sent out by Jesus on mission as lambs among wolves, going to all these villages and towns and places, declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand and healing. Well, the 72 returned to Jesus with joy from this incredible mission, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now then to Luke chapter 11, picking up at verse 17. This is following Jesus's yet again another deliverance of uh, someone from demon possession. But he, knowing their thoughts, this is religious leaders who are opposing him and saying that he's done this somehow because he's in league with Satan. He, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, How will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, 
That's an, another name for Satan, Lord of the Flies. It means Lord of the Flies. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. I'll come back to this passage. We're going to preach on it in a little while. But Jesus is talking about his disciples being the judges of their so-called seniors in the Jewish system. Now, moving on to the big point here, picking up at verse 20. But if by the finger of God I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are secure. But as soon as one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his full armor in which he trusted and divides the spoils. So whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And now on to the revelation. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them day and night before our God has been thrown down. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even unto facing death. Because of this, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, because the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that he only has a short time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. The edge of eternity loves victory. Well, let me tell you a little story about the Iwo Jima beachhead and then battle, which raged 79 years ago on Tuesday, which may actually be the date that uh, Veda Rackley is born. That marks the 79th anniversary of the conclusion of the gruesome Battle of Iwo Jima. I think we have some slides, I hope we do, that I can kind of give you the visual. There it is. So uh, there's uh, some Marines, basically a Marine, U.S. Marine battle on the island of Iwo Jima back in early 1945. And uh, Leonard Nettervelt, who was a 19-year-old Marine, U.S. Marine, had not seen significant combat until Iwo Jima. His baptism into full-scale war was in one of the most gruesome battles of the entire World War II, Asia or um, Europe. He was there for about a week uh, when, when a particular event happened. So. Let me tell you also, Leonard was able to see the raising of the U.S. flag on Mount Surabachi, uh, one of the most iconic you know, pictures that's actually a photograph from World War II. Uh, Leonard was not right there, but he heard all this applause and he looked across the plain and saw the Marines raising the flag um, at Mount Surabachi. But a little while later, a couple days later, in the fighting, this was gruesome fighting, highest rate of casualties of the U.S., I believe, in all of World War II, just Marines being chewed up at Iwo Jima. Uh, Leonard was commanded by his sergeant to go take his grenade, Leonard's grenade, and to blow up uh, 
basically a, a bunker area where they thought Japanese were firing on them or surely were hidden. So Leonard ran across, courageously across some terrain, pulled um, the grenade, clicked it, pulled it, and you know, waited the obligatory number of seconds because you didn't want it thrown back at you, threw it in the bunker, and all of a sudden, when you know there were not Japanese soldiers there, it turned out that was a major ammunition hold for the Japanese. And it was also connected to a further ammunition hold, which meant when that grenade went in there, it didn't matter how fast Leonard could have run, he was going to be in bad trouble. And sure enough, the explosion, the massive explosion, like a bomb going off, engulfed Leonard. It's amazing he didn't burn up, he wasn't eviscerated by it, but he was blown over 10 feet, possibly 15 feet into the air. Uh, folks who saw it, fellow Marines who saw it, said later. And of course they assumed he was dead, he looked dead, he got blown, you know, multiple yards away from where he was, and there was confusion after the explosion. And Leonard, 19-year-old Marine, was left for dead at the edge of eternity. He'd been thrown up from Earth into the edge of eternity, and now he was at the edge of eternity because he was about dead, but it turns out he was not dead. But he was behind enemy lines. So what do you do when you're behind enemy lines, you're badly injured, and you're almost dead? Well, one thing that Leonard did is after a while he recovered himself. He slept in the dark. He thought he was going to die that night, but when he you know, made it through the night, he decided, look, I'm going to crawl in the direction of noise. I can't see. His vision was gone at this point. He couldn't see a thing. But he could hear a little bit, and he could hear noise. And he hoped and he prayed that the noise toward which he was going to crawl now Part of his mouth and face were blown off. He had you know, injuries to the rest of his body, but he was able to crawl. The area that he crawled toward turned out to be Marines. But that's not such a good thing because Marines, when they see somebody crawling across the ground in this highly contested area, they're gonna be a little bit suspicious about it. And sure enough, uh, one of the Marines was about to shoot him. He kept holding up his helmet. And then another Marine said, I think that's a Marine. They didn't shoot him, and he made it closer to them. They went and picked him up, and after six months of hospitalization and various surgeries and having his, you know, part of his mouth wired back and some further adumbration of help, he was able to come back home after the war. He was left for dead at the edge of eternity, but it turned out sometimes when you're at the edge of eternity, God has other plans. And God has plans that are going to call you to himself, right? So one of the things that, one of the reasons I'm highlighting this story right now is because of what happened Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Monday morning, um, I was able to be with Leonard's great-grandson. I'll come back to that in a minute, but let me share with you what, yeah, let's go back to the basic points on Leonard, because we really need to get this. Leonard believed that the war was real. It, there was no question about it. It was obvious, you know, after Pearl Harbor, we were at war, okay? And so Leonard believed that there was a real war with, with a, an opposing force, regime, the empire of the rising sun. And you know, the Japanese were very serious in their Shintoistic uh, religion and their belief that the emperor was a son of the gods and represented the sun, uh, the rising sun, which is predominant, you know, god, god type image, pagan image. And the, the, the Japanese soldiers were all sold out. The entire nation of Japan was sold out, uh, that their cause was just and that they needed to prevail. So this was a real war. They would fight to the death, to the death. Um, Leonard, secondly, I really want you to get this because this is important for today and for Holy Week and for being a Christian. Uh, Leonard chose sides. And when I say he chose sides, he didn't just kind of, I don't know, go to a movie and buy some popcorn and say, why, well, I hope we beat the Japanese. I hope we prevail. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Y'all go at it. 
hope, hope it's nice on Iwo Jima. He didn't do that. He actually chose sides and joined into the mission, the campaign. And then third, he trusted the edge. He trusted at the edge of eternity that somehow in this story, the United States had some kind of edge. And we actually did. If, if we were gonna persevere, I mean, it was really hard to persevere, but sooner or later, particularly Midway marked this, other things marked this, we would eventually prevail in World War II against the empire of the rising sun. So Leonard trusted in that, and he trusted in the call, and he uh, always stayed faithful, always faithful. If you're a Marine, okay, I got the Semper Fi thing in there for you, right? Always faithful to the way of victory and salvation. Now that's at a kind of secular level. Uh, but yeah, let's go back to it. So part of the reason I'm telling you about Leonard is that's Leonard over there. That's a few years ago at the 73rd anniversary of the Battle of Iwo Jima. Leonard is no longer with us on earth, but that's him towards the end of his life. And then that's me praying over his great grandson who was born to our church family on, on Monday. Uh, that's, that's Leonard's great grandchild, little Alexander, who was born Monday, and that's me Tuesday morning praying for him. Mara, you know Mara Cox, one of our newer members. That's mom. They were actually with us a little bit earlier for the Easter egg hunt uh, this morning. You probably saw Mara with baby, right? Baby Alexander and uh, an older boy as well, uh, Oliver. He joined, Oliver joined in the egg hunt. So. We need to remember this, and we need to put things in perspective as Christians. So let's pull back and put this in perspective as Christians. First of all, today, I want you to get three main developments or movements or points to this message. First of all, I'm inviting you as a Christian, and if you're not a Christian, I'm inviting you into the truth of the larger reality, the world in which we live. I want you to believe in Jesus, but I want you to understand he's not just a nice little religious figure. He's the whole thing, okay? So number one, believe the war at eternity's edge. Believe it, it's, it's for real. God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. This war is cosmic. It's a lot bigger than this little earth in which we live. And it's spiritual conflict. Secondly, I'm gonna invite you to believe in, to love and join Jesus the King. In his gospel, his name, which means salvation, the name that will ultimately prevail. Every knee will bow ultimately to this name. His campaign, what he came to do, what he's still doing in his mission, the mission to which he calls us, the campaign, and his reign, his rule, his kingdom. I want you to believe in these things to love them and to join Jesus in them. And this is gonna come not by our asserting ourselves, but instead our submitting to and trusting in redemption, that he's gonna redeem all creation and he will redeem all those who belong to him. He'll save us, restore us, make us new. Redemption by grace and love. Because he's gonna go into this campaign, it's just remarkable not with a big army, he's gonna come into Jerusalem riding a donkey, unarmed. So just brace yourself for that. His, his style is different, okay? And third, I'm gonna invite you to rejoice in, to love, and to live by his victory, and specifically his ascension to authority on high, to heaven, and his return. The Bible says that all those who love his return will be glorified in him. Do you love his return? Is your life about his return? At the edge of eternity. So, first of all, believe the war at eternity's edge. You got God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. And it is a cosmic and spiritual conflict that actually intersects your heart and soul. It's not something that's just out there this conflict goes on in the middle of each of us. Which way will our heart go? Which way will our soul go? Which way will our families go? What, what values 
God's kingdom values or Satan's seemingly more attractive values? So this, this war goes all the way back to after the fall, one of the most important verses of the Bible. If you don't know this one, you really need to learn this one. It's called the Proto-Evangelion. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When the Lord God curses the serpent, the Lord God says to the serpent, I will put enmity, that means there's going to be a war, okay? I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, your Zerah, and her Zerah, her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, you're both going to be mortally injured. Your seed, her seed, will be mortally injured, die. But he's going to take out your total authority. He's going to crush your head. He's going to eliminate your kingdom. And through that, his kingdom will prevail. That's Genesis 3.15. That's what God just said. Well, let's go on to the story of Jesus coming to earth in the beginning of his public ministry. Who's the first major entity or person in conflict with Jesus in his public ministry? Can you guess? Satan, the devil. Uh, so let's just read the, the end of the temptation account in Luke's gospel. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him, he left Jesus, until an opportune time, is the, is, is the war over? No. This battle is done with, with the temptation. But the devil is going to wait for further opportunities. That's Luke chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus speaking, and again, I said I will come back to this passage later, but Jesus speaking in, in what we read in chapter 11 says this. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Does Satan have a kingdom? Yes. According to Jesus, he absolutely has a kingdom. According to Jesus, which we read in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 31, Satan is the ruler of this world, this present world in which we live. According to the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Satan is the god of this present world. I mean, Satan's on top right now, according to the Bible. This is not some kind of fringe interpretation. This is directly running all through the Bible. Now then, speaking of Holy Week, let's go ahead and go to this. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. This is after the Last Supper. Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you. And notice I've emphasized this to you. I want you to get this. This is humnas. This is all. Humas. This is all. Okay? This is plural. So Jesus is talking to Simon, but he's saying, Satan has demanded to sift all of you disciples, the whole group. And in fact, all of the disciples will fall away from Jesus leading up to the crucifixion and during the crucifixion. You know this, right? Okay, so Satan has asked to sift them all. That's plural there, right? Humas, okay? But then notice this. He's asked to sift you all like wheat. And this is just like with Job, right? Satan, until he is totally taken out, has the capability to accuse even the elect in the courts of heaven. This is what Jesus is talking about here. So, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to have you so that he can sift all of you. But, now Jesus focuses in on Simon Peter. But I have prayed for you, Sue, that's singular in the Greek. I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you, it's singular again there too, Sue, have turned back, in other words, repented from your denial of me. I'm calling you to strengthen your brothers. So Satan is right part and center in the story going all the way through Holy Week. In fact, he's very prominent in the story of Holy Week. If you miss this, you pretty much miss what's going on as Jesus heads to the cross. So the Apostle Paul calling on us as Christians after the cross and after the resurrection and after Jesus' initial ascension says this, put on the whole armor of God to take your stand against 
the schemes of whom? The devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now I know, look, you may have your kind of typical straw people that you go after. I don't like these politicians. I don't like these sports leaders. I don't like these celebrities. I don't like that group on campus. I don't like this group on campus. And that person, when I see him on cable news or on uh, you know, Twitter or on uh, whatever, I mean, it really upsets me. I think if we could just get rid of him and elect this person in place of that person, the world would be saved. Not quite, Christian. You're a Christian, right? You're a Christian, right? <laughs> Look, let's, let's go back to this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Should we be concerned about politics? Yeah, absolutely. Should we be concerned about flesh and blood? Yes, but that's not the real battle. You're foolish if you think that's what's really the, the top level. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness. This means spiritual powers, demonic powers. This is what Paul's talking about. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So, number one, again, believe the war at eternity's edge. And then number two, believe in, love, and join Jesus the King, his gospel, his name, his campaign, and his reign. His name, his campaign, and his reign. Redemption by grace and love. Go back to this passage where Jesus is speaking in Luke 11. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers the strong man, of whom is Jesus speaking? Himself. Who is stronger than Satan? Jesus. You mean even incarnate, where he's emptied himself and become one of us? Yes, exactly. That is the central way it's going to happen. Taking on our flesh, taking on our place, taking on our sin, and going to the cross. I mean, it's incredible. The devil, as smart as he is, couldn't figure out that this was coming. But the one who is stronger is actually Jesus. So he's been talking about, like, would, would Satan go against himself? No. But Satan is the strong man. He's in control right now, right? But look at this. When someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, in other words, the strong man, he, the stronger one, that is Jesus, takes away the armor in which this man, the devil, trusted and divides his plunder. So then Jesus says, it's on. It is on. And so Jesus says this, you better listen to this. Whoever is not with me is against me. You're either with me in this battle, because if you're thinking you're passively on the sideline, you're actually against me. That's what Jesus is saying. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So let's remember our good friend Leonard. He chose sides. He joined the campaign. So also, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said to all, If anyone wants to come after me, here it is, folks. It's right in front of us. He must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Remember those would-be bogus so-called disciples or Christians that Dean preached about a few weeks ago at the end of chapter 9? There's three of them. They all have excuses to why they can't do it right now. Ever met somebody who claims to be a Christian, but they're, they got all these excuses about why they're not all in right now, why they can't serve, why they can't evangelize, why they can't give, why they can't you know, be committed to Jesus right now? Because they got a lot of family obligations. They got a lot of this or that. Jesus deals with this with these these three would-be bogus disciples. And remember this in a couple of the responses, chapter 9, verse 60. To the guy who wants to wait until his father dies so that he can handle family affairs and inherit and get a good inheritance so he doesn't have to worry about following Jesus, Jesus says this, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, now. And then to the guy who says, Look, I, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, but first let me go back and say goodbye to all my family and friends and kind of have a good time with them and come with you, Jesus. I'll, I'll be there in, in just a little while. Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I want you to catch this conflict now. The, the Greek here is blepo, to look back, okay? The missionaries who actually go with Jesus, unlike these guys who bail out, they're going to see everything. They're going to see the kingdom. 
but the people who claim to believe in Jesus but keep looking back at their stuff and their family and their past, they're only gonna see their stuff and their family and their past, which is all fading away. It's all the difference in the world whether you see what is coming at the edge of eternity or whether you're always looking back to hang on to stuff. So that brings us to then third. We have this opportunity, we'll talk about it a lot on Easter, to rejoice. Rejoice in love and live by Jesus' victory, his ascension, and his return at the edge of eternity. Because guess what? Guess who has the edge of eternity? Guess who has the edge for eternity? The devil? The powers of this present age? Jesus. You, you choose well and faithfully if you trust in the one who rode the donkey into Jerusalem, the one who was stripped and crucified, seemingly had lost by the power of grace. Because guess what prevails? The schemes of the devil? are God's undying love. God's undying love for you, if you will receive it, wins. God's love won the victory in Holy Week and in the age to come. Believe it, believe it. So look, I've broken this out so you can see this. Now I want you to catch this. Um, let's go to the next slide if we can so y'all can see this. Okay, Luke is very intentional about this and I want you to catch this. You've got one going up and one going down. This is the most important, pivotal verse in all of the Gospel of Luke, 9, verse 51. When the days were approaching for his, for Jesus' ascension, do y'all see that? And in other words, that means ascension to heaven through the cross and through the resurrection and then the ascension to heaven. And Alemsios. Okay, y'all see that, right? Over on the left. Jesus is going to set his face to go to Jerusalem for this. Now look over at the right. Our key verse for today. Jesus said to them, I saw Satan do what? Fall from heaven. So who's going to end up being ascendant? Jesus. When Jesus looks at the cross, the gruesomeness of the cross, and dying in total love for you, what is he seeing? He's seeing his ascension, his return to the Father in glory, and also what does that implicate? The fall of Satan from where? Heaven. You see how that matches up? That's not by accident Luke is giving you that in this central core of Luke's gospel. And so therefore Jesus said, this is what Holy Week's about. Also, Jesus says this is recorded in John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Cast out from where? Heaven. John 12, 31. Now, these are prophetic words from Jesus. It's still in process until he comes again, just to give you that. Okay? It's in process. If, you, if you're interested in deeper stuff, join me in the Revelation study or Sunday morning for Sunday school. But just keep going now. Revelation 12, verse 9. The great dragon was thrown down. Same ekbalo verb here, all the way through. In the Greek, it's the same. You're clicking all these together, right? The great dragon was thrown down. Ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. But we already saw this about three years ago when I preached through Isaiah, right? Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 and 13, speaking on its face about the Babylonian empire and the Babylonian ruler, right? We're prophetically looking to Satan here. Isaiah 14, 12 and 13. How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, Hillel, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground. You laid the nations low. For you said in your heart, catch this, what do all the great powers want to do? And under the spirit of Satan, what does Satan want to do? I will ascend to heaven. Y'all see this, right? The Hebrew totally tracks out here with the New Testament. Allah, I will ascend to heaven. 
Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. Is he going to win? No. Because of Holy Week. So with the days approaching for Jesus' ascension, does he take over the world? No. He comes in bare, empty, on a donkey to take it all. All evil, all sin concentrated on him that everything might be turned upside down. In Jerusalem, of all places, where evil is most deceptive because it's supposedly so religious. Luke 9, 22, Jesus says, It is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes. Remember, those are the three categories in Jerusalem on the Sanhedrin. Okay? In Jerusalem. And be killed, and on the third day be raised. So what is the reason that most so-called Christians, in name only Christians, can't follow Jesus? Because they suffer from the disease of me, me and mine. It's all about me and mine. In other words, this is thinking too much of me, my time, my plans, and thinking far too little of the master and his mission. I want to invite you, as we head into this last week of Lent, to reframe, move away from me to the master and his mission. It's all the difference in the world. Whoever is not with me, Jesus says, is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. But here's incredible good news. With that big picture, with that huge cosmic deal going on, Jesus loves you personally and invites you into the salvation that he is bringing about. I love the way Paul puts it. It's like, I have no more of me left, Paul says, but nevertheless, Jesus loves me. Okay, Jesus loved me and he loves me. Listen to this, Galatians 2.20. You know, this is one of my favorite verses. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's not about me, it's about him and me. Listen to this. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So when Jesus was doing all this cosmic, ultimate battle and victory in Holy Week, he was also doing it for you. Will you believe? Will you give yourself to him? If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it. Don't you understand, Jesus says. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So at the edge of eternity, Jesus is the edge. I mean, he's going to win. He's already basically won the ultimate battle. Trust in him, his gospel, his name, his campaign, his reign. And redemption by grace. Be a person of grace and love, not a person of hatred and division. This world is full of people of hatred and division and me and mine. Be a different kind of person. Be a Jesus person. Grace. Love. Speak with grace and love. But nobody else speaks like that. I know. You'll stand out in the crowd. You'll be like a light in the darkness. So, back to Revelation as we close and then move to Romans. Now the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser, that's the devil, get back to this next Sunday too, the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God has been thrown down, and they have conquered him, because they were in the mission, they actually believed in Jesus so much that they're in the mission, right? They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto facing death the edge of eternity, redemption by grace and love. And here's the promise we have. The Apostle Paul, even on the other side of Jesus' cross and resurrection, he knows it's not yet, but he's already seen it. As we move to the close of the classic epistle to the Romans, listen to this. This sums it up. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. In other words, through Jesus, we get to share in the victory of Genesis 3.15. Remember that? 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's not a throwaway line. That's not a nice little liturgical line that we like to hear at church. That is the gospel. The grace, the saving, conquering grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Believe it and live it. Now and forever, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, open us up to the truth and to the big story that you bring about in your son, Jesus, and let us love and believe in Jesus and go with him. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, The Wonderful Cross. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.